Guest host Dave Sobel joins us this week to share his insight on two huge ConnectWise acquisitions, plus Axiant launches a business availability platform, Citricom takes aim at Slack and Teams, and more. It's Channel 4 Weekly, episode 123, Donuts, Lettuce, and Tomato. Channel for Weekly, episode 123. My name is Matt Whitlock, technology editor, online director, and your host of this fine program for you, the bars, the MSPs, the integrators, the IT resellers. If you do things with technology and have a really long acronym in your in your company business, you are probably in the right place. Also in the right place is, this week is our executive editor rich freeman who is our great co-host of this uh, program with me here and a special guest today mr dave sobel uh who is the uh he's with msp radio host of the business of tech and co-host of killing it please welcome both of them hey you know what matt we are not only uh in the in the right place here we are in the only place to be if you work in the smb channel at all we are coming to you live from a uh, conference room we are not authorized to be in and could be kicked <laughs> out of at any moment. Uh, and, but we're at the, uh, the event site for the ConnectWise IT Nation Connect uh, conference, which is going on right now in Orlando, Florida. And uh, huge news coming out of this event, so this is the place to be. And, so you are, and all the drama of us being potentially whisked out of the room and the news to talk about. I was going to say, so like, we can see people with like big clubs and sticks from the hotel like saying, you're not authorized, get out of here, arrest them. That would be fun. At any minute. <laughs> so <laughs> they, great they suspense they here on uh, Channel Pro Weekly this week. So in, in, we will try to go through things a little quicker just so that doesn't uh, happen on camera, even though secretly I really wanted to. Uh, Dave, for those who are not overly familiar with you uh, or who you are, what you do, why don't you kind of give us a, a, a little rundown of you? Sure. Thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. And thanks for having me. So I'm Dave Sobel, I, I ran a solution provider for about a decade in the DC metro area. Uh, just like everybody else, it was grew from managed services practice from nothing uh, all the way to exit. I sold that business and decided to try something different, flipped over onto the vendor side, spent eight years as a vendor uh, with companies like Level Platforms, helping transition them to be sold to AVG, then over to GFI, which became Logic Now, and we helped sell it to SolarWinds. I just left SolarWinds a few months ago, and I've struck out now doing podcasting and focused on analysis and information that you need to be relevant in the channel and, and what you need to know to go forward from a technology perspective. So as you mentioned, I do two, two different podcasts, uh, a daily podcast called The Business of Tech, five minutes, what you need to know that day with some analysis, as well as a weekly podcast with two other hosts, uh, Ryan Morris and Carl Polachek called Killing It. It's more like, pardon the interruption, to uh, take 30 minutes and three topics and we break it down. And I, I can tell you from personal experience, they're both great shows. I'm, I'm uh, uh, regular listeners and fans of both of them, honestly. So Business of Tech is about five minutes a show, right? And knowing Carl Palachuk and uh, the, the other name there, that one's probably a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little length, le different lengths for everybody's needs. So. Right, right. We, and it, uh, Channel Pro has a five minute uh, uh, little skit that you do with uh, Eric Simpson. Isn't that correct, Rich? Uh, that's right. And uh, as a matter of fact, we recorded an episode of that from uh, IT Nation Connect yesterday. That is called the Five Minute Roundup. Uh, and that is a, a video podcast once a week that uh, Eric and I do. And we pick a, a big news story of the week that we talk about a little bit. And then Eric has a, a business tip. He is a, a consultant to MSPs. So uh, he will bring a free uh, business growth tip to you uh, to that show. And uh, then we usually have a little fun at the end and send you off on your way. Fantastic. A little longer than five minutes, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> I was say, normally they're like 10 or 15 sometimes. Yeah, but. the original <laughs> concept was five minutes, and uh, we just can't shut ourselves up. But you guys do a good job. It's, uh, it's great insights. I listen as well. <laughs> That's a, a standard in Channel Pro broadcasting is uh, way, going way over time. Uh, you know what, Rich? It is uh, November 1st, which means uh, yesterday was October 31st, and I'm sure you and Dave got a chance to go trick-or-treating, right? Did you put some costumes on? Bags full of candy. <laughs> all through the vendor hall. The vendors were all giving out candy. There were costumes in the vendor hall here at IT Nation. And I was saying, CompTIA had the, the peanut butter Reese's Cups. They were oh, the, I bet they the, were the big, the winner. big uh, winner there. Yeah. So you, you walked around with your little bag. Did you actually say trick or treat and they give you tchotchkes? Is that how it works? Well, a bunch, bunch of people brought their kids. So actually, they, we were letting the kids be the ones to say trick or treat. You know, isn't that who normally ends up with all the tchotchkes anyway? Is I know like when I go to a show, I, if, if I do grab something, it's usually never for me. It's usually something neat for the kids. 
Well, this time we cut out the middlemen, had the kids directly <laughs> here, and let them get the tchotchkes directly. Well, that's what we need. More kids at conferences. I'm sure that would make it more fun. <laughs> hey, and you know what else is fun, Rich? Uh, the Channel Pro SMB Forum event. It is now a mere days away. So it's November 1st. Um, our event is on November 6th, uh, 2019 in the Newark, New Jersey area. So, um, Rich, tell people why they want to be there for that. Uh, well, they want to be there for that because this is the most uh, information-filled, action-packed one day that you can invest in your business, basically. We have got a, a really super lineup of content for you this year. Um, we've got a, a panel discussion with uh, very successful MSPs out there talking about uh, how to embrace the everything-as-a-service business model. Uh, so they're going to be talking to you about some as-a-service opportunities that you can get into that maybe you're not uh, taking advantage of today. Um, we've got several people who are doing cybersecurity as a service, really sort of specializing in security right now. They're going to be doing one-to-one uh, -one interviews on stage about their best practices with our colleague, Colleen Fry. Um, there is a, a really great um, roughly half-hour session you're not going to want to miss. If, if the Internet of Things sounds like this weird sort of whiteboard concept right now and you don't know how to actually incorporate that into your business, um, we've got a, uh, an MSP from California named Luis Alvarez who's going to be out there. He's going to be talking to you in very specific terms about the uh, IoT-related services that he's offering right now that are making a, a big pile of money for him. And uh, folks, you can do exactly what he's doing. Trust me on this. So um, really, really interesting content. And there's, there's way more than that, um, uh, basically. So you, know, you, you give us a day, we're going to send you home with uh, a ton of really specific, actionable ideas that you can put to work as soon as you're back at your desk. And, and you get to meet Mr. Dave Sobel, because I believe you're going to be there. Is that correct? I will. It's, it's a great event. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Lewis is a super smart uh, solution provider. He's got a lot of insights, and I'm really looking forward to, to meeting everybody. Awesome. So definitely make a trip out for that. Uh, so if you can invest a day, make sure you come November 6th. Uh, Events.channelpronetwork.com is the website where you can register. So run, don't walk there, and get yourself signed up because uh, space is filling very, very quickly from what I understand. Uh, if you can make it a two-day um, ordeal, we do have a pre-day event with the 20. Uh, they, and Rich, give a, a, a quick little uh, overview of what the 20 offers. So uh, the, the 20 is, you know, sponsoring the pre-day. They're, they're basically a managed services co-op. So the easiest way to think of them is a bunch of MSPs got together, uh, pooled funds essentially, and um, this is allowing them to uh, share the processes, collaborate with customers in a safe kind of environment. They get discounts on software and so on. They really sort of present themselves to the market as one organization, but um, each of the individual locations is 100% independently owned. So they're a little bit like a franchise organization, but you're not buying a franchise from somebody. It's still your business. I interesting group. And uh, they're doing a pre-day uh, with us in which they are going to be sharing lots of uh, real-world insights on uh, becoming a high-growth MSP. They've assembled a panel of MSPs and vendors who are going to share some, uh, some uh, insights and thoughts on what it is that uh, the really successful high-growth MSPs have in common. And it's, it's, so it's like a 7-Eleven. Do they get slushy machines? <laughs> uh, no, but no, well, okay. I, you know what? I'll, I'll take a note on that because I'm moderating a panel at one point. I'll ask because that could be the, the secret that maybe they've been, uh, you know, trying to keep under wraps. The secret sauce. <laughs> it would work for me. I don't know about you. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's also a cocktail party after that uh, pre-day session. So if you can make it two days, um, it will definitely be worth your time. If you can only make one, absolutely make it November 6th. Our main day show, you will leave with lots of great uh, information, actionable uh, material to, to make your business better. Plus, Dave, you can even admit, we make it a heck of a lot of fun. And it's a great show. You guys really do. It's a great, great, a lot of fun, a lot of opportunity to meet other people, interact, and, uh, and win some great prizes too. So there you go. November 6th, anywhere in the New York metropolitan area, folks, Newark, Philly, anywhere, anywhere in that neighborhood, make it a point to be there on November 6th. Information is at events.channelpronetwork.com. All right, Rich, we've got a big news story uh, to talk about, and it sounds like uh, Mr. Dave Sobel is the right guy to have with us to talk about it. ConnectWise, uh, or, uh, yeah, ConnectWise just spent a lot of money. <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> That's exactly right. And actually, you were exactly right as well to say that um, it is uh, fortunate for us to have Dave here. I, you know, I was talking with Dave, I interviewed Dave for uh, the cover story of our next issue just a few weeks ago, and we were kind of talking about podcasts, and hey, you should come on our podcast, and we're, we're both going to be at IT Nation Connect, let's do it there, 
And then it turns out this story breaks. And so <laughs> it just could not have been any more um, lucky for us because, uh, as he said, he's he's been an MSP. He's worked on the vendor side of the line. Um, so he is, you know, ideally situated to comment on this. So let me set it up from the news guy point of view for you. And this is a big, big piece of news. ConnectWise has acquired Continuum. Uh, and a company called IT Boost that a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with. But let's start with Continuum. So we all know um, that uh, we are in an era right now of consolidation among vendors in the managed services space. So uh, Datto and Autotask merged to form one big company. Kaseya has been going out there. They bought Unitrends and Rapid Fire Tools and IT Glue and ID Agent. Uh, Dave used to work for SolarWinds. They've made a whole bunch of really uh, important uh, acquisitions, most recently Pass Portal. So you're, you're seeing these big players emerge uh, in the market. And one of those big players was this company Continuum. Uh, and now Continuum and ConnectWise are one company. So essentially we went from what I would say is five really big players in the managed services market now to four because two of those big companies have uh, decided to become one company. Now, if you look at this from a whiteboard perspective, what we know today, it actually kind of makes a, a lot of sense for ConnectWise and Continuum to become a single company. There is one um, significant and obvious point of overlap. They both have an RMM tool, and I will come back to that in a minute. But really beyond that, there isn't very much overlap, and there, there are a lot of complementary aspects to what these two companies do. So on the ConnectWise side, um, you know, they've got, in addition to RMM, they've got a PSA. They were a pioneer in PSA. Um, they do uh, quoting, they do remote control. Uh, on the connect, uh, continuum side, rather, they do BDR. They've got a uh, fairly robust and continually uh, growing security uh, offering. They have also got outsourced uh, network operations and help desk and now security operations services. So you kind of add all this up, basically, and you've got a complete set of line of business tools to run uh, your managed services business. You have access to backup and security, and security is huge uh, in managed services right now. And then you have the option, if you choose to take advantage of it, of outsourcing things like help desk and network operations center uh, functions uh, as well. It all kind of fits together nicely. Now, like I said, um, both companies bring an RMM tool to the table, and so immediately people who are using one of those products now are going to be wondering what, what happens to the product I'm using. Is it going away? Are they going to combine these two things? Short answer is um, truly, um, they don't know. Uh, I asked them this uh, in, in a call earlier in the week, and they said this whole deal is so new, we have um, just not had time to figure that out yet. After IT Nation Connect ends, they're going to sit down and start road mapping some things out. But the, the sort of initial kind of hint direction that they were um, leaving us with in the, the media was um, they very much, one of the reasons they like this acquisition is because it sets them up to go after two kinds of MSPs. The ones who uh, Jason McGee, the CEO of ConnectWise, referred to as the do-it-yourselfers, the ones who really want to deliver all the services on their own, and the others who actually prefer outsourcing parts of the business so that they can focus more on business development and let somebody else do the help desk and the, the network operation stuff. And so there is a certain logic to maybe having two RMM tools for each of those two communities of MSP. And then the other thing I'll say um, before handing this over to Dave and getting his perspective on this is um, he used to work for SolarWinds. They've had two RMM tools for some time and they haven't dropped off into the twilight zone that I've noticed. It hasn't been some giant problem for SolarWinds. So maybe it wouldn't be a big problem for ConnectWise if they continue to have two RMMs. Yeah. So Dave, my, my first question, and I think this is the most important one because You've got a lot of experience here. Now that ConnectWise and Continuum are kind of become one company, the prudent thing that they need to do now is to rebrand four times, correct? Well, of course, every time <laughs> that rebranding is clearly your first move, rebrand everything. Totally makes sense. <laughs> I say that because Dave worked for GFI, formerly known as, you know, like, uh, right. I was formerly Hound Dog, then became a GFI, then was Logic Now, then bought my solar wins. I've got lots of, <laughs> lots of titles right now, Brian. You know, Rich, this is, it's really, at first glance, you would think, oh, this is super exciting. But I want to actually dive in on a couple of specific things and really, I'm going to put my analyst hat on hardcore here. You called it a buy. The financial terms of this deal were not disclosed, okay? This is important. Why? Continuum and ConnectWise, both of the same investor, Tom Abravo, Very we have no idea what the financial terms of this were. I am speculating, but they could just be moving money around in a fund. 
They're both owned by the same investor. We can reshuffle things around. I am confident a few people made some money on this deal, but we don't know. <laughs> so, so, so let's, let's be really specific on this. Was it a buy? Was it a merger? Were they pushed? Out? Nobody knows. That's now, important. <laughs> now we do know what, what we know. And this is absolutely true. Um, but what we do know is the press release from ConnectWise said that they, they bought these okay. two companies. So I can speculate it was a dollar deal. I'm just, I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just, it's a buy. That's Damn important. it. I had a dollar. I could have bought and Connect or continue. <laughs> I bring this up because it's important to understand the investors, what they just did. What they just did was take together two companies and do what we call a revenue roll-up, where we are taking the two and now the larger entity has much larger revenue numbers. That looks good when you take that out into the market. You are now a much bigger company when you take it. Look, I get it. These people are, are in the business of making money. Go on them. That's the move. But let's understand that motivation as they do it. Rich, you're 100% right. One plus one equals two. You've taken two. You've taken two companies that focus on slightly different portions of the market. Continuum was really great at people that believe in the outsource knock and sock. Those are company organizations that want to outsource that. Whereas Connectwise is a company who's preached do it yourself, build it yourself, own that piece of the relationship. Now they have both sections of the market. One plus one is two. But my observation on this is nothing is different today that wasn't true two days, two days ago before the announcement. There's no technology differences now. There's no, you know, there is one overlap on the RMM. That's true. But all the other products were available before. They are no different now. <laughs> I, yeah, no, and it's a really um, important point. And I, I, uh, it's why I sort of highlighted when I was setting it up that on the whiteboard, you know, it looks really good because everything sort of fits together. But, but how the MSP benefits from that is still sort of TBD. What, what do they, now that they have this set of relatively complementary assets, what do they do with it that wasn't done before? They, you know, the, the only thing that's different today is there's one person, you know, one company to go to for all this stuff where it, it used to be two. And there are people out there who are using ConnectWise for some things. And can, right. So they're cutting one check now instead of two yeah, checks. Yeah, totally. But, but that's not, you so, know. Totally, totally makes a, a lot of sense from that perspective. And, and the other thing, I had a brief hallway conversation with Arnie Bellini, the, the founder of uh, ConnectWise yesterday, and he said one of the things that excites him about this is that there is sort of an escalation path, a growth path that one company can offer an MSP now. So if you're still out in the break-fix world, you want to get into managed services, you start with some of the continuum stuff. It's like flipping a switch and boom, you're in because you don't have to build a help desk or a network operations center. You can just rent one, essentially, and then... As you grow and mature, you can kind of grow yep. into some of the ConnectWise tools and, you know, as stay with that one uh, vendor as your, as your business grows. So that, I, you know, is a picture yep. of how this could be beneficial. Yep. And, and I think you brought up the RMM piece, so I'll make my, my comment on the, you know, I'm going to make a prediction, a complete, I don't have any inside track on this besides my experience in the industry. They are not going to disrupt anything because they like the revenue. Let's call it out. These companies, particularly their investor, is in the business of preserving their customer base and preserving the revenue. They are not going to do anything that disrupts that, and they will tread carefully to make sure they do not disturb the customer bases. I predict two RMMs as long as they've got the revenue coming in, and that makes financial sense. <laughs> and and I, it's hard in the, in the world of managed services software, it's hard to think of anything that would be both more complicated and more dangerous than merging those products or shutting one of them down. It's like, you know, tossing a hand grenade right. into the customer. So, yeah, I, you know, you would think they're going to figure out a way to just keep these things. And then, you know, they were talking um, uh, in the, the uh, press conferences that they did earlier in the week before the news became public. They were talking about how there's some uh, automation capabilities in the Continuum product that, you know, the ConnectWise Automate doesn't have. So they'll, they would, just within the next few months, they're going to be taking some functionality from the Continuum tool and adding it to the ConnectWise RMM tool. And, and you can imagine uh, functionality flowing in the other direction. I mean, there are things you can do to integrate those products mm -hmm. and to enable them to benefit from one another without disrupting an MSP's business. But, yeah, it's hard to imagine them. Yeah. So, so you've just highlighted all the things to watch for. 
right now it is a let's watch and see them execute. You can see, you should watch the plan unfold over the next few months. You'll see their ability to do something and you can make judgment calls based on that. That's where we're going. And, you know, I'll make a, a much broader point here, and I'm really interested to get your perspective on it because it, it sort of occurred to me after uh, the general session a few days ago when this news um, finally became public. Um, you know, so I was talking before about all of these acquisitions Kaseya has made and all the acquisitions that these other companies have made. And now, you know, um, ConnectWise has made, and, and actually we haven't even talked about IT groups, by the way. I was, I was just getting um, ready to, to say, this is, there's actually a trifecta here that's coming yeah, together. Right. Yeah, so that, that is a managed services documentation tool. Um, the leader in that space right now is IT Glue. Kaseya bought IT Glue. Um, ConnectWise, you know, it had a, a fairly complete set of line of business software for MSPs, but th there was that gap uh, in, uh, in the uh, services that they could offer, and they have filled it now by buying um, a relatively well-known uh, documentation. And, they, they, you know, same story, basically, where watch the integration, let's see what they can do to make one plus one equals three on that side. Yeah, so I, I, got, a, I got a real take on, on IT Boost. So first off, I'll start with the congratulations to the entrepreneurs behind IT Boost. IT boost. Good for them, right? That is actually the mission of, of somebody is you've identify a gap in the market, you fill it with a product, <laughs> you build up a company, and you exit. So congratulations to those guys. I think that's that's fantastic news. The entire documentation space should not exist. <laughs> Let's call it out. This is these, these long-standing players in managed services missed the mark on deploying features. Companies stepped in to fill that void sold it. So we had IT Glue, we had Passportal, and now we have IT Boost that had stepped into there. They made money, good on them for identifying the hole in the market and filling it. But then how did this work out? The vendors bought them and are now able to charge for a feature that if they'd done it before, they wouldn't have made the revenue on this. Funny how that all works out. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, a really awesome take, uh, actually. On on the I, and I've not heard it uh, put that way before. But and what's especially interesting about that to me is um, I interviewed. I had a chance to interview the three founders of IT Boost yesterday, um, and they, you know, from the beginning, their their vision for the product has been this is going to be the first console that a technician looks at in the morning. Basically, this is what's going to kind of set them up. For everything they need to be and from there from that window you kind of remote off into rmm and, and psa as, as you need it and i sort of asked them i mean are the connect wise guys into that you know vision too does that sound right to them and they said yeah absolutely in fact they they had that vision for some kind of a documentation tool before they approached us and so absolutely it's like yeah but rich i, I would be i would be remiss if we didn't point out I believe the RMM tools want to be the first dashboard that you log into every morning. The PSA wants to be the first dashboard. And now the documentation guys want to be the first dashboard. Uh, I get it. It's the most valuable real estate. Uh, <laughs> you know, but, but I've heard this vision before. Look, they identified a hole in the market. Kudos to them. That's the right play. And it makes a lot of sense. I think it's on the solution providers to hold their vendors accountable for the features that the products need and where they should be putting their time. I think that's really, this is an example of the solution providers need to hold the vendors to feet to the fire on execution to plug the gaps that they need in their business. And, um, and execution brings me back to a point, uh, once I remembered, we hadn't even talked about IT booths, but there was a point that I was sort of uh, sidling up towards that uh, occurred to me after this news went live, um, which is just, you know, Kaseya has bought a bunch of companies, data, there's been tons of merger and acquisition space among uh, these leading vendors now. And I am wondering, Dave, if you think we are in for what I'm starting to think of as a, a period of, uh, like a managed services software tryptophan effect, where all these companies have to digest all these other companies they bought. And while they're doing that, there's gonna be very little innovation happening. You know, it, it, we could be in for 12 to 18 months of, of relative quiet, um, in the, the managed services software space while all these acquiring companies have to kind of integrate all these acquisitions. Rich, we're not entering, we're already in. So the, the guys from ConnectWise stood on stage and they called this an innovation. And I'm gonna challenge that 100% and say there is nothing innovative about this at all. It's a financial deal, makes perfect sense, I totally get it, but there's no innovation here. We are in a period where I really wanna hold these companies accountable and say, what have you released to the market in the past two years that has been impactful. 
What they've done is they've bought other new businesses to sell into this space. Totally makes sense. New offerings, that's good for solution providers. But who has actually made something new? They haven't. <laughs> well, the, some of them have made many, many new single panes of glass. Well, so sure. That way, so that way you have eight <laughs> single panes of glass up on your screen right. all the time. You know, you have. I have a single pane of glass. It's called the browser. Let's <laughs> <laughs> let's move beyond that. You know, come up with something new. Actually, create something. And if your strategy, by the way, is to invest in smaller companies and let them do that, cool. Let, if that's the way this, then oftentimes that's how markets mature. But this isn't innovation. It's financial stability and maturing of the market. And by the way, private equity needing to make money. This is all a natural progression of a market. I'm not criticizing it. I'm just observing that's what it is. is has somebody done something new? No. Do I anticipate these guys doing something new? My prediction is no. I'll sit, turn to them and go, prove me wrong. Somebody come out with something new that they can do this. And I would be remiss if I didn't then go, guys, why don't you solve the actual problem? Where's my Mac agent? Where's my Chromebook agent? <laughs> We're talking about managing people's computing experience. Where is that? <laughs> I, and I will say, and, and I, I'm not necessarily endorsing this point of view, but <laughs> as a guy who spends plenty of time talking to these, these vendors, I think what they would say what they would um, identify as the innovation factor, and it gets us into this whole weird kind of area, is the superior levels of integration that become possible when one company owns, you know, and so instead of um, integrating via APIs, we own all the code, we can, we can integrate tighter. And that, the words deeper integration came up a lot in the ConnectWise press conference. They came up a lot on stage. Um, here. So I, I think that would be their answer is you're gonna see, and uh, like at Kaseya, they, they refer to it as workflow automation or uh, workflow integration, you know, that, that we're gonna be able to connect these systems up in ways that weren't possible before. And I say it gets us into a weird area because there are, you know, most MSPs are using products from a combination of different vendors and they, for very obvious reasons, get very nervous when this consolidation happens and they worry about, am I going to be able to use something from Datto here and from something, something from ConnectWise over there? Will they continue to work together? And so anytime there's a big acquisition announcement, the acquiring right. vendor says, we are 100% committed to open APIs and sure. open integration. So it's like, you're integrating now, you can continue to integrate, and yet integration is the innovation, is essentially the message every time. And so... I, and, okay. And, so again, I'm, I'm boiling it down. So you could integrate before and you're going to be able to integrate in the future. Uh, I like my status quo. That is not innovation. <laughs> bring, bring me something new. Uh, I get it. And like, and look, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be dismissive of integration because there is absolute value in it. Yep. And done really well can drive really big differences. Somebody bring me the did really well. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's fair. I think, I think that's the vision that comes up over and over again. And I think we, you know, and this goes back to being in this quiet period now where yeah. there's a lot of digestion happening. We haven't really seen that brought to life yet, but that, that is, you know, the, the vision, the, the logic, the innovation logic, I guess, behind. Yeah. So, so, and so, so that's for the solution providers listening, a couple of statements. First off, nothing's different. Right, All, everything we've just said is is status quo. So there's no reason, no panic. Don't don't stress. Don't anybody don't don't anybody worry. Have a critical eye to what's going on. Rich, you're a hundred percent right. We're entering. We're in that period. Let's watch him execute. The one that executes will be the one to make a difference. Let's wait for them to prove it. <laughs> Let's wait for them to prove it. Somebody execute and do this really well. Yep. Yeah, totally agree. Well, that is what we will watch out for. Um, but uh, bringing new co you know, companies out there and buying them, acquiring them, merging with them, whatever, isn't uh, the only thing going on with ConnectWise right now. Uh, they have done something to help with partner relationship. What, what's up with that? Yeah. You know, ordinarily at an IT Nation Connect show, if, if ConnectWise introduced an entirely new product, this would be big news. 
I, I may be one of like two people in the media who even reported on this. Um, and, and I had it in the podcast too. Okay. So, yeah, so okay, we're the two guys. That yeah. Reported yeah. On. <laughs> uh, there may be a few others out there, but it, it we'll really still call is. it an exclusive, though, Rich, because Dave yeah. Sobel's here. You can have the exclusive, Rich. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, ConnectFly, you know, they, it's not as if they have 15 different products. They, they've added a new one. Actually, they um, announced a new they one. They announced it. Yeah. It, it has not <laughs> hasn't come out yet. And for reasons that will become obvious, it, it may or may not actually do all that much. But it, it's, uh, it's called Engage. And the idea uh, basically is, you know, you as an MSP, you're probably doing business with 20 different um, vendors right now. And that means 20 different partner portals. 20 different places at least um, to go for uh, training materials and marketing resources and so on. Different interfaces, different passwords. It's kind of a mess. Chaos is the word that ConnectWise folks use. And so they've created this tool called ConnectWise Engage. And the idea basically is it is your single pane of glass for getting into all of these different partner portals. Um, now, I asked during this um, press conference that uh, happened a few days back, you know, so on launch day, how many other vendors have signed on to, to you know, make their portal accessible through uh, Engage. The number stands at zero right now. Um, and they were, they were quite honest in saying, you know, we're, we're announcing it here at this event. And now the work begins to go out and recruit um, people to, uh, to actually participate in this. And, you know, it, it, it's not just um, it's not going to be a simple thing for a third party vendor to connect to engage. I don't know how, how complicated it will be, but there are going to be certain um, formats and standards and protocols and so on that you'll have to kind of stick to so that engage can align all of this stuff from all of these different companies that, you know, the, the vision is a compelling one um, from an MSP standpoint, the, the efficiency that would come from having one place to go to get all the resources you need from lots of different companies. But, the, those other companies have to be on board with that vision. They have to be willing to make the investment that's required to be a part of the tool. And all of that is TBD. So, so my analogy on this is this is like me announcing that I have signed to buy, to build a new house. Uh, you've got to wait a year to have the housewarming party. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is Look, it's exciting, right? I'm intending to build something. Uh, but there's no benefit now to the market and there's no actual product. And I think that's important to, to highlight. Uh, the announcement they said next year, and specifically the language they used was late next year. So we don't actually know when. I'm going to call it. It's vaporware till it's out. <laughs> uh, Rich is right. There's something interesting to the vision. Uh, part, you know, vendor management is a challenge. Uh, they're going to have a couple of hurdles. You're exactly right. You highlighted there are exactly zero vendors in it right now. <laughs> the, the, the math of this is, is intriguing. The partner problem is you've got all these different partner portals, you have all of these different pieces, and the partners have complexity here. But is the model, how are they going to go to market? Now, I'm speculating. I have no insight, but I'm going to make, put my analysis hat on this. If they go to the other vendors and say, hey, we're going to charge you 20% to be part of this, why are those vendors going to give up that margin? It doesn't make any logical sense for them. They ConnectWise has to figure out a way to make this economical for all of the parties involved for it to actually happen. <laughs> and I think that's a way bigger challenge than, than we're acknowledging here. And until that gets until they announce that, this is a watch and wait. Now, from a timing standpoint, and uh, they were they were non-committal, they were a little fuzzy about this, but I will say, because you know, I inquired about that as well. And the, the very loose expectation they set was that we, we might have something to tell you about partnerships come IT Nation Explore, which is the other IT Nation event. That's June 2020. Okay. So they're, they're kind of, you know, they, they were willing to go out on that one a little bit and say that we, we might have some, uh, some specific vendor names to give you by then. But, um, but you know, I, again, they, they also were very forthright about saying we're just getting started. Yeah. So it's, it's early days. Uh, let's, let's see how that plays out. But you're exactly right to say there was an announcement in there. There's an interesting vision. Let's let's see how that plays out. I, I don't know if this is a unique vision, though. Is it, Rich? We've seen, I, I seem to remember other companies saying, we're going to offer this final single, finally the single pane of glass that, acts, that you can get to all your por portals through. And it, it seems like, to me, this is, this is like chasing a unicorn. 
there are, I've seen many companies try to do this. None have succeeded. Do you think ConnectWise will succeed? Uh, well, I mean, so the, the um, single pane of glass vision, obviously, is one that has uh, inspired uh, lots of different products out there. Uh, I, I can't, offhand, I can't think of, of one that is, um, you know, specifically focused on partner programs. Yep. And I offer the channelized pride. Right. And has not, and not, not as, has not, did not succeed at that. Yeah. But I, and I think it comes down to the financials. It really, this is all about, does everybody make the, the amount of money they want? ConnectWise or anybody is asking another vendor likely to give up some margin in order to deliver on this service. And the vendor is going to ask, do I do better by going through this route? I think it's interesting. The other thing is, is you can see ConnectWise looking a little bit more and more like a distributor. Yeah. You know, like they, they are making moves that make them at times look more and more like a distributor. They have multiple items on their line card that you can purchase from them that are, you know, connected products. So they have multiple antiviruses you can buy from ConnectWise. Yeah. That looks a lot like a distributor. <laughs> this, this is answering a distributor problem. You know, and it's inter it gets us into a whole other area we don't have time to talk about, but it, it is interesting how uh, a number of different companies are sort of um, starting to look like distributors. I mean, the, you think of the AWS marketplace, the mm -hmm. Azure marketplace, the ConnectWise marketplace. There are all these sort of alternatives now to the, the uh, traditional distributors where you can go and it's a supermarket full of stuff that you can, you can right. shop from. But, but by the way, distribution is a tough market and small margins. <laughs> and, if, and, if and, if, and if you're a product company trying to command those larger margins that you see in product companies, or by the way, a company with investors that want to see that high level of profitability, this is hard. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to see how they play this out. Maybe they've got a secret sauce. I hope they do because you're right to identify this is a real problem for partners, but this is a wait and see. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm sure from their perspective, you know, the, the key challenge from a ConnectWise perspective is to develop that critical mass of users. They, you know, the number they throw around is um, they've got 25,000 MSPs in their community. If they can get, a sufficient number of those people bought in, you know, to using Engage, then the vendors no longer have a choice. It's like, I've got to play because that's where the MSPs are. Um, if the MSPs stay exclusive. <laughs> uh, because, right. So, right. So, yeah, we'll, that's a good so point. we'll see. Yeah, we'll, yeah. See, we'll see. Well, and I, I think it's always also trying to make things simpler, right? The, the, goal, the goal is noble. They want to make things simpler for the MSP. Oh, and, it's solving a real problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're not alone. They're not alone in, in wanting to do that. In fact, Axient is, uh, just launched a converged business availability platform around the same thing to make delivering business availability solutions simpler. Rich, tell us about that. And this would, uh, this would be you know, significant news in a typical news week, uh, too, actually. And it kind of got drowned out a little bit on, uh, by some of the news here from the ConnectWise show. So this is actually another story involving um, private equity money coming into the managed services market, pulling companies together. You had um, uh, eFolder, which had already acquired Replibit and uh, Anchor, and so it, it already had uh, a variety of different kinds of uh, data protection and file sync and share products. And then eFolder and Axiant merged, um, uh, I think I want to say July 2017. Uh, about a year ago at this time, they rebranded just as Axiant. That became the name of the combined company. Um, they hired a new CEO right towards the beginning of this year. His name is David Bennett. He used to be the chief revenue officer at Webroot. And the first thing he did after he became the CEO was go out on the road and visit a bunch of MSPs. And he came back with some pretty strong impressions. And, and the impressions basically were that it is way too painful for the typical MSP to deal with data protection right now. You've got Again, lots of different products, um, often from different vendors, but in the case of Axiant, they were all from the same vendor, but they were siloed products. They were separate products with different interfaces. And, uh, uh, and so just you know, mastering all of that was complex. Um, purchasing the stuff was complex. They, when David Bennett became CEO, there were almost 1,500 SKUs um, for Axiant products because you were, you were choosing the product and then you were choosing the length of the contract and you were choosing how much storage capacity that you were getting. You were, you were looking at overage fee. There are all these different variables. You combine them all, you get 1,500 different SKUs. Um, so very complicated. And so he decided after meeting with a lot of MSPs that what he was going to do was make all of this simple. 
And there have been um, a, a number of different steps, sort of interim steps along the way between then and now. Um, what they announced this week is sort of the biggest step towards that vision. They, they launched this um, converged platform. It's called X360. It's essentially a, uh, a unified interface, dare we say a single pane of glass, <laughs> into uh, all of these different um, tools from Axiom. So now it's one place to buy the licenses and manage the licenses. Um, one place, by the way, the same interface gets you into all of the billing and the marketing tools and the enablement and training tools. So they've, they've pulled that together. They've made that experience a lot simpler. And then what they've been doing all along the way, and that you're, you're finally now beginning to benefit from in a serious way, is um, simplifying the pricing. So Matt, you might remember, and I'll, I'll follow up on this because I actually asked the Axiom folks a question based on our conversation about this, but you might remember when Axiom announced that they were offering unlimited storage and retention mm -hmm. um, to their customers so that you don't have to worry about a three-year versus a two-year term and, and how much capacity you're buying and, and so on. Um, that and some other changes they made enabled them to get from almost 1,500 SKUs to 11. Um, now, so well, there's, a, there's a small difference in that number. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not, not bad, and yeah, in terms of uh, simplifying the model uh, a, a great deal. Now, um, to go back to that site, I interviewed the Axiom folks yesterday, which is officially when this news broke, and I said, you know, I, we talked about this on the podcast. My co-host said it's, it's a really great idea, but if you offer people unlimited anything, they quite often take too much of it um, because it's free. It costs them nothing incrementally to do that. And so I, you know, it's only been a few months. What are you seeing? And they said, so far, so good. Nobody is e exploiting the opportunity. Um, and their their thinking, basically, the reason why they felt comfortable taking this risk was they have um, 15 years worth of data about how MSPs consume backup storage space, and e everything they know historically about that tells them, and it's unlikely somebody's just going to suddenly decide to dump every video ever recorded by you know, uh, YouTube uh, onto their, their data store. So they're not feeling too worried about that, but um, you know. Yeah, we'll we'll see. This is, this is, from my perspective, this is interesting because if you manage for the edge case, if you manage for the edge case, you make things overly complicated. You really do. And you over, you, you over engineer for edge cases that don't happen very much to the detriment of your core business. And I think, you know, kudos to them for figuring that out. That is by, by saying we're going to focus on the 90% of things that work the way it's supposed to and grow that real business and just not over engineer these use, these extreme bits. They're seeing benefits from them. And I, I think the other thing that, that my comment on this was is, you know, good on them for executing the vision. If you're going to buy all these disparate products and pull them all together, this is the value that they promised. Hey, now they're delivering it. Back to our earlier statements, right. we have a timeline now to say this is how long it took. Like, how long did it take? How, when, when did these companies come together? A year ago? Uh, so, Axiom and eFolder merged July 2017. Okay. So, right. Two, yeah, it was, two, it was in July. If you want to learn more about that, you can go back to episode 55 is where we talked about that uh, particular merger. So, so, there we go. You can do what? 123 minus 55. See how many episodes ago that was. <laughs> yeah. That tells you how, how complicated this is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that bringing these companies together takes real effort. Here's an example of the execution. Now it's up to the, to the marketplace to judge, is this worth it? You yeah. know, will, is Axiom competitively different now by bringing these solutions together into a single pane of glass? Is it executing different? Is it more efficient? There seems to be some evidence that it could be. Uh, and the other thing to know is, you know, I was asking yesterday about um, just the pricing implications in, in general. I mean, are you, are you paying more? Are you paying less because of uh, any, you know, the stuff coming together? And they said, you know, in general, loosely speaking, um, their products are about 25% cheaper than they used to be, you know, coming out of the simple simplification process. So uh, there is that, you know, element of the, the synergies in the story as well. Very cool. All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. I hope it makes it simpler. Uh, it certainly, I mean, I think it certainly seems easier for the MSP. Uh, to do business with them now and getting rid of all of the different tiers and stuff. Um, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about uh, one of my favorite companies to watch because they're, they're growing and they're doing all kinds of cool stuff. And that's Citricom, who's just added a pretty big feature to their unified communications platform. Rich, tell me about this. 
This is really interesting, um, actually, and I'll be curious to get Dave's take on this as well. And, and you know what, you're, you're absolutely right, um, Matt, Citricon has been an interesting company to watch this year because they have just done a lot to build out um, their product set and to enhance and, uh, and update uh, everything that they do and add new features and so on. Um, they think big, and boy, you can't think too much bigger than what they just did here. So, what, I mean, at the simplest level, what they did is add what they're calling business messaging technology uh, to the platform. And so, you know, um, SMS has become such an uh, enormous part of how people communicate with one another. If you're in the unified communications business, as Supercom is, you, you pretty much have to support SMS texting. Um, but they kind of went a step beyond that. You know, there are certain kind of technical limitations associated with SMS text texting. So creating their own SMS-like uh, messaging service enables them to get around that in terms of things like attachments and, and so on and so forth. But they went beyond that even a little bit because the other messaging-like experience that's becoming increasingly uh, familiar to people is the experience that you get with tools like Slack and Teams. Um, so Teams is um, one of the newest components in Microsoft uh, Office 365. It is growing like gangbusters. Slack is an enormously uh, you know, well-known and widely used program. And what Citricom folks are, are hoping is that this new business messaging functionality they've added to their product essentially serves as a, a simpler, a less complex, a less sort of um, weighty alternative to Teams and to Slack, they, you know, for the SMB space, they said, what the functionality you get with Teams and, and with Slack is, is too much, it's too complicated, that there's way more there than a typical small business in particular needs. Maybe they're gonna be happier with and, and better off with our business messaging instead and getting that with their unified communications platform. And I'll just say, you know, th there is nothing gutsier, basically, for a company the size of Citricom to do than take on Microsoft. Uh, you know, and that, that's, that is uh, that's 100%. I want to start with a wow bold. Uh, you know, so because and there's a couple of details in here that, that talk to how bold it is. So first off, Teams and Slack, I'm not sure that they are too big. You know, they're too big for the small business. Teams and Slack both have had massive uptakes in the SMB market. They're very, very popular products. And I wouldn't be remiss if I didn't observe that Teams is outpacing Slack now and is moving very, very fast. So you are taking on Microsoft with this move. The other detail, and I don't know if you caught this because I covered it last week in Business of Tech, the announcements by all four of the major US carriers to agree together on the new RCS standard to move beyond SMS to the RCS standard for much more rich communication so they're moving into this space right as SMS is, about, is going to probably get depreciated over time. It'll never go away, but it's going to get supplemented by the new RCS standard that Google's pushing for, that the carriers have now all agreed to. Wow, Citricom, you are moving in to some <laughs> volatile space. Now, they could be right, right? They could very well be right that business messaging, the way they're envisioning it on endpoint devices, is the way SMVs are going to work. We've seen, uh, we've seen success uh, in terms of business messaging when we look at what Apple's done with iMessage and their ability to deliver uh, business services through that for big companies. This, this, there's something here. You know, there's something on the way messaging works and the way that it's disrupting and letting it, you know, I'll, again, back to bold, guys. When we talk about innovation, here's somebody that's taking a gamble on something, and, and I'm intrigued to see how this one plays out. And you know, I'll, I'll bring something else uh, into the conversation here, and, and credit where it's due. I was I was chatting yesterday with uh, George Bardisi, who's the CEO of Bevoip, a Supercom competitor, right. and we were kind of talking about this a little bit. And he pointed out that um, Teams is free. Um, now, I mean, it, 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 comes, you know, it comes with a subscription that you know a lot of people are paying for already. But even if you don't do that, there is a free edition, like a starter edition of Teams um, out there. So, and so is Slack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, I mean, and at some level, so is SMS slash RCS slash iMessage. They're included in people's carrier plans. So you got to be delivering something of different value to charge for it. Again, kudos to Citricom, they think they are, and if they can prove to the marketplace that they are, it'll win. But I, I like a big, bold move like this, so I'm, I'm all in favor of it, and I want to see how this plays out, and I want MSPs to, to, to tell all of us. Yeah, I, I do too. I, I read this a little differently than you guys, and let me give you my, my thoughts here, and, and you can comment on that, Dave. 
Um, so w- when I think of team collaboration, that's when I think of things like Slack and Teams. When I think of real-time communication, I don't always view that as a team collaborative thing. Like, and I, I feel like they're not trying to be Slack. They're trying to make uh, communication just a little bit easier and faster, like um, more in the Skype for, bu- like Skype for business kind of area, not necessarily in the threaded teams, crazy uh, or Slack channel kind of view. So let me, let, me, let me see if I can communicate this out. I see a feature in here that I've never seen before. So you, you can, with, you, with this new communication tool, you can actually send SMS messages to people's phones, right? Which is something that, as far as I know, Slack or Teams can't do. Well, you can do point, you can do point to point messaging in, in Slack or Teams. So for example, I have, a, I have a Slack client on my iPhone. I can send you a message within a private channel and it's communicated via the app, but it responds with notifications the same way. So they're in the is, same way, but this can actually, this can actually text out to people's phone, a customer's mobile phone number via SMS, which is true. different. Yeah, there's integration points. You can't integrate Slack and Teams with, uh, with, with those communications. I've never seen it be done via SMS but it can obviously be done some of the other, the other texting or the other, you know, notification mechanisms. Right. So, okay. So, so it seems like they're, fo- they're trying to focus just on that aspect on like, I need to contact, I need to connect with my coworker on something quick, not necessarily something that needs to be done in a big collaborative team tool. Am I, am I, am I thinking about this the wrong way or, or do you think Cedric really is trying to push into the, the full team collaboration uh, services? So to give you a little bit of, of backstory here, so you, you might remember, Matt, because um, this happened uh, just like a day or two days before one of our, our live shows, uh, one of our conferences, there was this sort of big boom product launch from Citricom. In fact, we, we gave them one of our 2019 All-Star Awards because there was this um, wave of products, like seven major innovations, a year's worth of innovations that came out on one day. One of the innovations that they announced in that wave was, hey, we're going to be adding SMS messaging and, you know, and the kinds of things that you're just talking about there. Um, what happened, um, they told me, is that as their developers sort of went down that road, they saw the opportunity to do that, which would be new and important and useful, but more than that, too. So, I mean, I, I have it, you know, directly from the CEO of the company that they are absolutely taking on Slack and Teams. They, wow. they view this as an opportunity to do what those tools do in a lighter weight kind of way that is more suited to a, a smaller business. And I was asking about things like, you know, data retention um, for compliance purposes and all the things that the Slack and Teams folks have to think about when they're developing that product. And he said, yep, absolutely, we're doing, doing all that as well. You're definitely not getting all the functionality you get with Microsoft Teams, but you're, you're getting all the functionality that you need. So that, I, I agree with you, Dave. I, that seems like a big uphill battle against a company that essentially gives it away for free. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, look, you know, I, I, this is why people can be visionary, right? Is they see something the rest of us don't. Uh, and we, we, we have the luxury here of analyzing it. it it's intriguing. And I give them kudos for, 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 tr- you know, for going, if you're going to go, go big, right? Go big right. or go home. Yep. Uh, you know, there's, but, but it's, I, I don't, I'm not sure I see it. I want to be, I want to be proven wrong. I like to be proven wrong on this kind of stuff, but I don't well, see it. Well, and Citricom is a company that uh, so far, whenever they set their minds to something, they seem to be able to pull it off and in a, in a way that is very uniquely them. Yep. Very, uh, very, and, and you, and you can definitely see they're, they're identifying, there is a need here. There is a need. People are, 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 are focused on this kind of new, new way of communications. I can see use cases where this makes, makes sense. You know, for example, I want things not necessarily outside of my communication system. I want them trackable and searchable. That's the value of something like a Slack and Teams versus literally me just texting somebody. You know that that it is part of part of the system. So they're on to something. Saying if I can make it so easy as to just be like test texting and literally just be test texting, they might be on to something here. And if it plays with the rest of the systems and it and it and it integrates and it and it delivers additional value, yeah, maybe there's something here. There might be. Well, very cool, uh, very cool story, and uh, we will watch that feature and see if it gets any any uh, take or. Uh, uptick in, uh, in, in usage. So we have one more news story that we want to talk about, and that's uh, a 
from Tech Data, who I see. Whenever I see the word government aggregator, I like I start to kind of my eyes <laughs> droop. Like, okay, they bought a government aggregator DLT. Now, I, I DLT is not an acronym I'm overly familiar with. Now, if it's a BLT, I would be like, oh, they're 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 buying sandwiches, but they're not buying sandwiches. What did they buy? They bought uh, DLT uh, Solutions, which is a, a fairly good sized, uh, now, you know, I, I want to say distributor. We used to call these companies, companies distributors. Um, Tech Data these days refers to themselves as a solutions aggregator. Um, and uh, the point there basically is we're not just sort of shipping products anymore. We, we have relationships with uh, hardware makers and software makers, and we are going to help you, uh, Mr. and Ms. Channel Pro, assemble the right combination to deliver a solution to your customer. We're going to aggregate the pieces and even round them out with some services that we can provide on your behalf and, and help you bring solutions to your customers. That, this is exactly what DLT has been saying for a while that they do for their clients uh, in the public sector, the U.S. public sector, so federal, state and local government, and so on. Um, and so Tech Data has uh, acquired that company now. It's obviously part of a... Um, a uh, pretty uh, significant strategic push uh, on Tech Data's part into that public sector market. They're going to be bringing on board a lot of expertise and supplier relationships that they didn't have there, um, and uh, positioning their uh, the customers to take advantage of that. There has been there have been a number of stories um, involving Tech Data and public sector over the course of the last 12 months or so. They've definitely um, had their eye on that market, and we we spoke on the podcast about um, something they introduced uh, just a couple months ago where um, they are making it possible for uh, resellers that don't have government contract vehicles to kind of borrow them from companies that do. And um, th this is the biggest, easily the biggest move that they've made in terms of that public sector uh, push, but it's something that they've uh, clearly had on their radar for a while. Yeah. I mean, I, and, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. I have tons of friends in government consulting. Uh, my experience has always been the government consulting organizations and commercial consulting organizations look very different. They're different. There are very much different payment cycles. There's different engagement. And particularly when you say federal, that looks really different. <laughs> the federal contracting space is unique for its own, you know, complexities. Uh, I like this. I mean, I like this from the, from the perspective of tech data offering lots of different ideas. And I've always thought that, you know, anytime you can make it easier to partner, I, I stumble across, across an opportunity, I get something as a solution provider, and I can't deliver on it. You want to be able to say yes. This is one more arrow in the quiver that says, I can say yes to things like this because I can then partner and deliver something. So from a, you know, from a broad portfolio perspective, yeah, make, makes some sense here. Do I think this is going to be 90% of the market, you know, the channel market taking advantage of this? I don't, <laughs> you know, but I, but I like it. You know, I like it from from the I'm going to fill out the portfolio and if and their play is to say we want to make it easy for you to find somebody to partner with. That's what this is. And so, what does DLT stand for? Does anybody know? <laughs> I don't. I don't actually. I have to watch go uh, check out their website. Yeah, there must must be something. Okay. I always just wonder, like when I see strange acronyms, like I wonder what that means, because it's not. It could be like donuts, lettuce, and tomato. Now there's a combination. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Talking about bringing together the ends of the market, there's a combination. That, that would make for an odd sandwich. I do have to. I do have to say. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I don't know if there's a whole lot there to, to discuss more than more than that. So if you want to read about uh, this particular. Uh, Move by Tech Data, uh, you can go to the show notes page for this particular episode, which is episode one, two, three. Um, and uh, we put links to all of the stories. So in fact, all the stories that we've talked about, you can go to the show notes page for, for this episode, or if you're watching on like YouTube, uh, you can open up that description area and there's links to each and every story. So that way you can follow along as we go. And, and you know, we always kind of cover and give our thoughts, but if you want to get to all the nitty gritty details, it's, uh, it's always in the stories here. So um, Rich, how are we doing for time? Uh, well, that is a great question. I would say I've got about 10, maybe 15 minutes max. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, I was hoping to be able to play uh, five questions with Dave Sobel, but we will definitely go over if we do that. So uh, we will save that for the next time you're on, Dave. Oh, great. Uh, no worries. 
And what we're going to do is we are going to move right into our museum pick. Now, now I learned uh, that you also have a, a kind of a museum yourself. I do. So I am a retro gaming buff. Uh, have collected all different, all of the all the Atari, all the Sony, all the Microsoft consoles, all the Nintendo stuff. I'm into all the handhelds. Have obscure devices. I have a working Vectrex. Wow! Uh, wow! Yeah, that, I, uh, that's that's my one of my crown jewels. My Virtual Boy just arrived back Wednesday, repaired, so that's now working again. Uh, yeah, I'm way into into collecting kind of the retro gear as well. That's super cool. I, I do have a good uh, retro gaming collection. Nowhere near as expansive as yours. I, so next time you come on, we got to get you uh, showing off a couple of the pieces that I wouldn't necessarily have here. Um, but I got, a, I got a pretty good amount. Uh, what I also have, and what Rich can attest to, is I also have an, a, just an outrageous number of old computers and computer components and laptops and CE devices. I, I mean, Rich, Rich knows this is a disease. That I have. <laughs> it, it sprawls from a, a room on the upper story of his house into the basement. You, you would have a lot of fun, I think. See, I, my, my wife has said, must fit in your office. If it cannot be contained <laughs> in your office, it cannot stay in the house. So I, I have a similar law here from my wife. It, it has to be in my office. There's like a bookcase in <laughs> another room that I, call, that I call like the showcase museum. And sure. I have a lot of like my phones and weird stuff in there that's small. And then Rich alluded in the basement. That is what I call the graveyard. So that is where like 1998 Windows 95 desktops like go to die. Go to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, but I, occasionally I do go down into the graveyard, and I, I think there are boxes down there that I've never even opened, <laughs> or at least never looked at in a long time. And I go digging, and I find some neat stuff sometimes. And oh, Rich, did I find a neat one for this week while I was digging around a box in the graveyard. So I'm going to hold this up here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell people who are listening, and I'm gonna, but I'll show it to people who are on YouTube. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see this. You'll have to read the, uh, the, the letters backwards. So this is a really, really old uh, peripheral from Belkin Components. Okay. Uh, this is called the, the Data Switch, F1B028E. So, Rich, we've been talking a lot about um, RS-25 or uh, the parallel ports and Tronics connectors and stuff like that. Well, yeah. computers back in the day had one, sometimes even two of those. But what would, what would happen if you needed to hook up three or four? Well, you would get, you would get this kind of device. So this is basically a, a wow. data switch for, the, for <laughs> parallel ports, uh, selectable A, B, C, and D. So folks who are listening, this is, a, this is like a beige box you know, kind of big for what you think, but like a desktop switch box. And on the back, there are, there are five parallel connectors, uh, four in, one out. And then on the front, there's like this good old style rotary clicky switch. Round click switch. <laughs> yeah. So look at, listen to that. Listen to that, folks. Yeah. That? That's, that's, that's good, high quality. I bet this thing still works. I, I have no idea to know if it does, but I bet it does. Oh, yeah. Work forever is that that's going to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That old computer stuff, like the early, like late eighties or early nineties, all, all the time period, that, that stuff did work forever. It was like yep. way over engineered and built with high quality components. So yeah, so I I don't know any purpose for this, something like this anymore, at least not for parallel ports, but perhaps Dave Dave, you've you've seen there's so a lot of parallel usage in industrial machinery and stuff like that. I guess you could hook four machines up with this and switch between them. But like, I think there are probably better ways to do that. There's probably think? better ways to do that. I mean, I, I think at this point, there are very few devices I can think of that would need a parallel port anymore. <laughs> Particularly in desktop computing. Like, but back in the day, like parallel, well, you could have a printer, you could yep. have a floppy drive. You could, a lot of stuff hooked up parallel. Um, but yeah, not, not so much anymore. Uh, USB pretty much killed off parallel and serial uh, it, for all practical applications. Uh, but this was a fun one. I didn't know, I didn't know I had this. So I, even I dis discover something new every day and look at this old, it's like this really old Belkin components, right? Yeah. yeah that's like, that's like an old logo. I, I got to figure out what year this is from because like, there's nothing on it. There's not a serial number. Take a picture and tweet it at them. Tweet it at Belkin and see if they uh, <laughs> they might want to see the, the, the in the uh, museum as well. They they might. I because like honestly, there's no serial number on this. There's no date of manufacture. 
it is it is literally just the model number and like a brief description on the front and that's it look at this nothing nothing if you were daring you could i bet taking the cover off of that there's some manufacturer dates either on the board or on the inside i there, that would be my bet there might be i i could take i could pop this lid off it's just four screws but we'll see but anyway kind of a fun one um, but, and here on the show, I, I, we also do a tech pick, Dave, and I like to kind of play that was then this is now. And okay. because there was, there's really, the, honestly, I, I did find some industrial parallel and serial, um, switchboards, uh, 16 wow. port ones. Um, but I'm like, eh, no, no one really needs anything like that. But, but in the modern day of, of, uh, industry, there is, uh, still plenty of USB devices and sometimes you need to hook up many of them. So the one that I, that I picked, and, and Rich knows that I have a, a habit of going on the, the StarTech.com website. Dave, do you know StarTech.com? I do, I do. <laughs> so like, I don't know about you, but like I, I'll, I'll go there to look to see if they have something. And then like, I'll start browsing around. And the next thing I know, like three hours has gone by because I'm just like, ooh, that's cool. I didn't know they made something like that. If I ever need to adapt that to that, that's what I'm going to use. And like, I can just browse around this site for hours. Uh, but I picked, I picked out a kind of a neat one. I'm going to pull it up here. Um, I can't, I don't know if I can do it full screen, but I'll put, I'll put the, the web page up so y'all can see, uh, here's this. So this is what it is for those, uh, for those watching, you'll be able to see it here. This is the startech.com ST 1030 U S B M. This is a 10 port industrial USB hub. It combines uh, ESD and search protection, a DIN rail, uh, or surface mountable uh, powered USB hub. So as you kind of see here, it's got, uh, you know, kind of the special ports you see here for um, industrial use. And there's 10 of them on there and it's got all the power protections, uh, 15 KV air, uh, contact ESD, electro, so e for those who don't know ESD, electrostatic discharge protection. Uh, seven industrial USB 10 ports from a single connection, surge protection of 350 watts, and uh, wide range of power inputs, seven to 24 volt DC terminal block. So if you're looking for something kind of heavy duty and industrial like to uh, hook up things, this is your, this is your go-to. What do you think, Dave? You need seven of these? You know, I, I constantly need more USB ports. I can never, because everything now is, is deviced. It's, so, so that's certainly, I mean, but that one is a big blocky one. See, the funny thing is you asked, like I would come up with the device I would recommend these days that I think is underrated that has way more uses since I bought it than I ever would have thought of is the Elgato Stream Deck. So I like the mini version, which is often on sale on Amazon these days for right around $60. It's the, it's the six button configurable version. Uh, if you find it on Amazon, the Elgato Mini Stream Deck. Now it's designed for streamers to be able to control various buttons. But since the entire thing is customizable, including the pictures on individual buttons. I've discovered that this is incredibly useful for things like go to meeting because you can put uh, you can make a mute button appear when you're in that application. I use it for recording the podcast. I can stop and start recording on demand with that and change the status lights of it. All the buttons are configurable. It is USB. And this has been one of those devices that uh, goes on sale reasonably regularly right now. And it's so useful. Very cool. Different concept from a switcher, but uh, I think I put the picture up uh, of what you're talking about. You did. That's exactly uh, the device. I, it's so here. useful to me. I now travel with it and throw it into my bag to, to wow. take it along with me. That is very cool. So, uh, so there you go, folks. Two for one this week. Uh, if you're looking for an industrial, and the, the USB port, uh, one I picked was kind of industrial because when I think uh, parallel port, I think more machinery, industrial uh, kind of stuff. So and we haven't really done a lot of industrial picks. But the Stream Deck is cool. I've, I don't have one of these. I've read about them, and I've, I've heard people talk about them. You might have sold me, Dave. It sounds uh, very, very cool. Totally worth it for any of us that do this kind of, kind of work because it's designed for that, but way more useful than you might think to be able to quickly add buttons to that. Yeah, very, very neat. So two for one this, this week, folks. Two tech picks for you. The uh, StarTech.com 10-port uh, hub that I was talking about and the Elgato Stream Deck, which is uh, Mr. Dave Sobel's tech pick this week. So... Thank you very much for uh, recommending that, Dave, and telling us about that. Rich, um, if you we, were going to uh, th look into the past and try to guess what happened. We have somebody who does this. His name is uh, Mr. James Gaskin. He has this uncanny ability to tell us what happened with, like, 
almost 100% accuracy. It's scary how, how good he is at telling us what happened in the past. Uh, mm-hmm. But then you have a tendency to try to tell us about the future, and eh, it's kind of hit or miss. <laughs> Yeah, 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 50 50 uh, on my end. But yeah, James, James is just rock solid on that. Uh, and, you know, every Friday on uh, channelpronetwork.com, he posts his uh, In Case You Missed It story where he catches you up on lots of stuff happening in the industry that, uh, you know, we haven't had a chance to report on. You may have overlooked. Um, this week, he'll be talking about uh, the latest addition to the uh, Microsoft Office 365 suite. Can you believe it took until now to get Project uh, in there? But Project is now a part of Office 365. Um, a couple of different ruggedized uh, tablets, one from Samsung, uh, another from Dell, that uh, were kind of interesting, uh, some new gaming chips from Intel, and then um, a, uh, an interesting story about what, uh, what happens when you're conducting bird migration studies and you're relying on commercial uh, uh, mobile carrier networks to keep an eye on birds, and those birds fly someplace you weren't anticipating. Overage fees, let's just say there were some overage fees uh, <laughs> encountered by some scientists who weren't prepared for them. You can read all about it in James' uh, latest column. Um, looking ahead to next week, of course, the big news in the industry is the Channel Pro SMB Forum, but um, Cisco is uh, holding their uh, uh, a, a big partner conference as well, and I'm sure there's going to be some interesting news um, from them out of that show. Well, fantastic. So as a reminder, that is correct, uh, November 6th, uh, any, anywhere in the Newark, uh, New York metropolitan area, uh, Newark, New Jersey is where it's going to be. Uh, Events.channelpornetwork.com. Go and register today, uh, and and be there or be square, as they used to say in the fifties. So uh, that is going to wrap up for episode one hundred and twenty-three. I want to thank everyone for joining, Mr. Dave Sobel. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of the show today. Um, if people want to learn more about you and uh, what you do and your shows and listen in, where where can people find you? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This has been a ton of fun. If you like like this kind of uh, riffing and commentary, that's what I'm doing with uh, some of the stuff that I'm up to. Easy to find at mspradio.com, where it's links to the shows. You can follow us on all the various social platforms and find all the different places that the shows are available. Business of Tech is on just about every platform from all the podcatchers to YouTube to there's an Amazon Alexa skill to put it in your newsflash. So. Wow, we don't have one of those yet, Rich. We got to build one. Yeah, no, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you want to follow uh, Channel Pro Weekly, uh, like, like Dave said, um, we're, uh, we're pretty much everywhere. The best way to do it is subscribe. Uh, we have tons of audio links. We're on Google Play Podcasts. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're pretty much anywhere podcasts are aggregated. Uh, if you want to watch the show, you can watch now on YouTube. Uh, we've got a, a channel there um, that you can uh, tune in and see our bright, shiny, happy faces and see the museum picks and tech picks as we, as we go through it. So uh, subscribe there. But if you just subscribe on YouTube, the subscribe button like doesn't really do anything. You got to subscribe and then you had to hit the notification bell because that's how you get notified of new, new posts and, and videos that we put up. So definitely do that. Uh, if you want to follow Channel Pro Network on the socials, we are Channel Pro Network on Facebook. We are at Channel Pro SMB on Twitter. If you want to follow me, I am at Matt Whitlock. Rich, what are you? I am at Rich Free. And Dave, what are you on the Twitters? I am at DJ Dave ET and MSP radio is at MSP radio news. Awesome. So definitely follow, uh, follow all of us and uh, stay, stay in touch and communicate with us and tell us what you think. If you want to email us uh, podcast at channel network.com is the email address. Got any thoughts, comments, want to uh, have us cover something on the show uh, by all means, please send us an email and we will, we will check it out. Uh, so without further ado, I want to thank you all for watching and listening and we will see you all next week.